In today's episode of the Mattcast, I'm going to be talking to a fellow YouTuber named Timmy the Sorcerer. He specializes mostly in old school gaming on his channel with live old school matchups and we had a fantastic conversation covering proxies, old school gaming, and where we both started playing Magic. It's coming up next. All right, I am here with Thomas. He has a YouTube channel focusing mostly on old school magic. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> well, I'm better known as Timmy, I guess, online. So I've got Timmy Talks, which uh, features old school magic, uh, MTG 9394, that is. And it goes from Alpha all the way to Fallen Empires. And sometimes we kind of go into the what we call newer stuff. So then we would go into uh, Homelands or Ice Age, but it's mainly really MTG 9394 with all the different ways of playing it. And with 90, so the old school format is mostly just cards from 93 and 94. That's the format. So where does it extend to? I know it's obviously alpha, but where's the end point? It depends on the rule set that you play. So if you play Swedish, you can play unlimited and then the four horsemen sets. So that's uh, Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, and the Dark. Oh yeah, uh, I follow a lot of those sets <laughs> on the market movers. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah like the move yeah. right to reserve list cards probably then for your videos. Um, and then you also have online mainly, but also like different play styles. For example, you can play Ravenna style. Uh, I think it's called Ravenna. Anyway, but then you can play with reprints as long as it's same art, same frame. So you, for example, you can play with the plateau from um, Revised. Although that's a bad example because it has different art, but that's an exception. Can you still follow me when I'm saying that? Yeah, I know what you mean. So there's rules on the types of cards. So you, for instance, you couldn't necessarily play a proxy or a gold border card, or maybe even uh, one of the collector's edition cards that have the square edges. Yeah. Exactly. And, and what you see now since the pandemic is that people have gotten more and more relaxed. So a lot of different play groups are like, well, it's really about the game. So if you bring a, a collector's edition or international edition, you can play. Uh, but it really... It's different tournament from tournament. I was playing in, in NoobCon 2 last week or two weeks ago. Uh, and that's just really the Swedish rule. So that means that you cannot play with revised. Uh, you know, you cannot play with collector's edition. Mm -hmm. But that, you know, that depends. Most tournaments allow a lot of different sets. As long as it's the same art and the same frame, that's the most important. Yeah, I mean, I guess if, if the uh, tournament is being, like, overseen by, like, the officials of Wizards of the Coast or Channel Fireball or uh, some big partnership, then they're going to be a little more strict. They they kind of it's almost part of like uh, you know keeping the market going. And they need to keep pushing yeah. the cards that they print to sell to people. They don't want people just bringing proxies. But obviously, if it's if there's no real uh, leadership in that department, then you know if you're just having a casual game with a few friends, I don't think it really matters what uh, what cards you're using. Um, yeah, I think maybe, but you know that better than, than me probably, is that it's, it's a lot like how EDH used to be, right? Because EDH was player run at the start. Mm -hmm. and, you know, old school is the same story. So what you do see in old school now is that there are a lot of different rule sets because people enjoy different games. And, you know, some, some play groups say, okay, we want to um, allow proxies, you know, and others say, no, we don't. We want to play with those cards. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I think it's all good as long as you know beforehand what you're getting into. Yeah, and I think that might also kind of scare some players and collectors into like the perceived value of their cards. You know, if people become super relaxed on using proxies, uh, they're you know, and, and proxies are only going to get better and better every year. Like with printers, uh, you know, getting more <laughs> computing power, uh, they're going to be able to, to design a lot more. Um, fake, I guess fake, fake cards. Oh. Yeah, well, fakes are going to be a problem. Fakes and proxies. I'm gonna. I'm kind of a. Uh, mm -hmm push you know melding them all into the same pot here obviously that they're very different things but I, I feel like as long as you're if you're a collector i think you need to have a certain percent of your collection like graded because that definitely at least uh it solidifies the authenticity of a card so if you're just going to be using it to play then i i feel like especially in regular play groups i don't think there's any problem at all using proxies i guess I don't know if I fakes are a whole other thing because that's your people are buying fakes. So that's, I don't support that. Like if it's a proxy someone made, that's fine. Fakes are a little different, but it's funny that you say that. Cause we, uh, we sometimes play like, uh, 
um, EDH uh, 93, 94, and then we allow proxies, but only if you make them yourself and only mm. two. So you got to show that you've put some actual effort into it and that there's a lot of love. It's not just, I, yeah. I, got, I got these cards from proxies from China and I put them in my deck. Now you really have to put some effort in. Uh, and then you also have people that say a proxy is already a reprint. So if it's later than un unlimited, so if I play with a revised Taiga, they would call it a proxy. So that also depends. Yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment because, yeah, if someone is going to be paying someone else for a proxy, then that means you're creating a marketplace for people to create proxies and sell them. And again, yeah, that could you know scare the collectible market. But at the same time, um, yeah, if you, as long as you're making them at home, I mean, they're not maybe not going to be the best quality depending on the printer you have. I mean, I, my printer is terrible. Basically, it barely does black and white. No, but you got to get, get markers, man. You got to make them yourself. You got to take a card. Oh, like yeah. A, I could just get like a Visera Seer, just like white yeah. at the top of this and then just make my own, say, Black Lotus at the top. There we go. I mean, you got to put some effort in, right? That's okay, so a little bit more effort than that. Okay, fair. I, I think bottom line with these discussions is always as long as your play group knows what you what you're all going to do and as long as everybody's happy with it right that's fair yeah. yeah and you guys have beers when you have your play groups together like before the pandemic obviously yeah man it's, it's definitely <laughs> part of the old school tradition well you can't be european without having at least one beer when you're playing magic i feel yeah. like that has to be a rule <sighs> there i don't know if you if you i think you've watched some videos on my channel right there's a tournament in, in groningen which mm -hmm. is in the north of the netherlands where we're just playing this this, on this beat up table it's like too funny it's like, i can i can send you a link later on yeah send me a link i'll, I'll check it out i want to see how many beers on the table this whole wobbly and stuff and you see beers coming in and out of the of the, of the recording see, and that's why that's a good argument for playing with proxies because if you spill the beer on an actual card like a, a revised dual land it's gonna hurt but if it's a proxy that's fine yeah it, it, it happened but usually you play double sleep and a lot of players actually uh play triple sleep yeah, I feel I feel like with the format like old school, I think triple sleeving is a must for sure. If you're if you're using authentic cards, you can't shuffle as good, man. I do I do double sleeve, but I have to say, mm -hmm. uh, you're more of the finance guy. But the, the the prices have gone up so much that uh, yeah, we're just gonna have to wait and see how we're gonna handle everything after the the pandemic. You know, when we can have tournaments again because there's been so many spikes now. Yeah, and well. As things open back up, I, I feel like the price could retrace a bit on a lot of these cards. Um, I hope. I hope. Well, I mean, there might be a shift more towards just competitive, right? Like if, if there's actual tournaments being held, like Modern was the cash cow for Wizards of the Coast for the longest time. Uh, then they, I feel like they just milked it dry with Master Set after Master Set. And then now they're looking at the collectability of the game with the collector's edition products. And now there's like three different versions of a booster box. Mm -hmm. so they're really pushing product, which is weird because this year, I think 2020, not 2021, they made more product than any other time that they've been around was of the coast. Yet wow. people couldn't play face to face the majority of the world. <laughs> and this is like paper magic. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a bit weird. Yeah. It's a, it's a bit odd, but obviously you can't, you know, see the future. It's not like they had this planned new, like, like uh, there's going to be a, a pandemic across the world. What I find so funny, like modern is kind of like, I, I hear that from more sources, modern is kind of like dying, probably going to make a comeback, I'm sure. But it, what I see in old school is kind of the opposite. Like there's a pandemic and you're playing it with a lot of uh, like older guys, guys that just, you know, they have a family and they're like, oh great, now I can play online. I can play at eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the evening. And, you know, and with online, I mean, you put a webcam on and you just, you know, you play with real cards. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually, uh, it has created a boost. You see mm -hmm. more and more tournaments. There's so many old school streamers now. Actually, as we're talking right now, there's a, there's a stream on Twitch. I mean, two even that I know of. I just wow, that, that's, cool So magic. do you think that uh, the webcam uh, gaming, I guess, side of Twitch, do you think that's brought more people into Magic? Yeah, that, into the old school scene, definitely. And I think a lot of people were like, "Oh, I want to play. Uh, I want to play with my old cards again." And then all of a sudden, they say, "Oh, wait a minute! There, are, there are so many things going on online." Because you have to understand, if you're if you're living in a bigger country, Netherlands is small, right? So we're very lucky to have a pretty big community for such a small place. But if you're in France or Spain or Italy, it's oh, you're much further apart. Germany as well, and now it's much easier to find somebody to play against. 
That's a that's a good point because before old school was a format you'd play exclusively, you know, mm. at with at a friend's house. There wasn't a lot of tournaments that were held by you know Wizards of the Coast or Channel Fireball that you know promoted old school as a format. Uh, I think it was mostly standard and modern for the most part. But now that people are at home more and they're able to play through like communication devices like webcams, I could see it definitely having an impact on its uh, well. Even the prices of the cards, not just the, the the popularity, but people they'll see, you know, their friends or people on Twitch playing, and it, it creates a sort of uh, environment where they actually desire these cards. They want to have these cards. They want to accumulate as many of them as possible. And that could be driving the prices up too. I think there's also some people who just don't like playing online. They just yeah. don't like it for whatever reason. Whether it's the face to face aspect of the game that they're missing. But they just, it's not something for them. I know I've played MTG Arena. I don't know if you have, but uh, I've noticed that I'll play one or two games and that's really it. And when you're, yeah. people or could just like, concede any moment they want as well. Like you can't really have a nice game, have a conversation in between. Uh, it really takes away that human aspect that I think really exactly. drives Magic the Gathering. It's like the best card game in the world. Yeah, but I have to say that like this, 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 how could you call it this in-between form, right? Between Magic Arena and playing real life and playing via the webcam, mm -hmm. right? This, this new version, it, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, because you're playing a tournament and you're playing against somebody who's you know, also drinking a beer, having time enough to kind of have a chat and a game, you know, it's, it's not just the game, it's also the social aspect. But you also sometimes have people that you're playing against who are like, I really need to Play, quickly play this game and you can hear the kids in the background or mm. sometimes the wife comes in are you still playing and, and you feel guilty for playing some kind of you know grindy control deck and you're like oh man sorry yeah that's why you got to play a uh, mono red burn right you got to make it as fast as possible you either lose I, fast or you win fast old school old school you can just go with uh atok is very popular you can play bull mm. lightning of course. that's the one where you can sacrifice artifacts atok yeah. okay yeah I mean, if you, if you play with Moxon and Mana Volts, if you can play with four Mana Volts. Yeah. Anything, mm -hmm. if, well, yeah, that's true. Or just even having any zero mana artifacts in there that you can sacrifice with Atog as well, right? I mean, see, yeah. I don't play old school, but there is cards that were printed in multiple sets, like Atog. That's that's a, a card that started, obviously, in the ABU uh, era of Magic, but then has actually evolved over time with different artwork and different sets. So what is your so what deck do you play right now in old school? What is your favorite deck in old school right now? Well, I've got Timmy's Spellbook, of course. Oh yeah, which is, okay. which is mono blue with four Timmy's. Yeah, which is uh, it's it's a fun deck to play. It's kind of old school blue control. Uh, you know, you got control magic. You've got counter spells. You've got the Timmy to kind of ping. Uh, you've got uh, icy manipulator. Uh, but I also play. I always want to cast creatures that give me a good feeling, right? So I've got the Tim, but I also play with pirate ship. Because mm. Protocol Sorcerer, he was Protocol, right? So he wanted to get away from college and went on a pirate ship to an adventure. I always like it when my deck tells a story. So I play with uh, Papa Moti, you know, Mama Moti Jin, Beta, like that. Yeah. We put it on the table. Uh, Ghost Ship. Yeah, yeah. Cards like Air Elemental, beautiful card, beautiful art. Yeah, uh, that was printed in a lot of sets too. Yeah. So, like, so, the, so you're saying your deck kind of tells a story. Mm hmm. So. Well, not all my decks, but yeah. Team so the spell. Timmy deck. So the story. What would the story be? So it's some. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, ships involved. Yeah, well, th th Timmy is in. Uh, is, is going to college, right? But he's he's got a taste for worldly pleasures. If you read the flavor text, hmm. so he goes on the pirate ship, and on his journey on the pirate ship, he meets all sorts of creatures, like the air elemental, uh, but also the Mamo the Jin. Anyway, there's a whole, and of course, like uh, uh, an icy manipulator when you're a wizard, right? Mm, yeah, that's right? that's a really popular card, I know, in old school. But it's so yeah. good, so diverse. It's one of my favorite cards because it's so diverse. Uh, but I also play Tron in old school. And Tron is a, a deck that has been around in lots of different formats. I mean, it's one of the most popular decks in modern. You can also play Tron in uh, Popper. It's very popular and that format as well. So that's the interesting thing about old school is that, that was the building blocks of magic. Uh, if you look at old school as a format, there, it's not really powerful from a standpoint of maybe legacy or modern, 
but there is still very powerful cards in it. But you pair the, like a lot of powerful utility cards with cards like Savannah Lion. You know, it's interesting because Savannah Lion was a card that used to be really powerful back in the day, right? Just like a one mana. Oh, two oh one. man. Uh, um, Savannah Lion sees a lot of play. You've got a deck called Lion Dip, which is Surrender for Free in Savannah Lions, basically. And then you play with all the power and you play the blue white control game and kind of a little bit like the deck with card advantage. Hmm. Um, but then you also have the speed of those cheap creatures. And that, so, is that a, so is that mostly a mono white deck? No, it's white and blue. White and blue. You, you, okay. Yeah. What happens a lot in, in, in old school. And now we're talking about more of the competitive scene, right? And I'm not very competitive, uh, but that's that you play um, all the restricted cards, uh, all the power cards, and then you're kind of trying to just get the best creatures in that don't cost much. And of course, you've got Mishra's factories to attack with. Hmm. And then you use the other control cards. Um, you have to kind of dominate the game. So do you like playing with a control deck? Because I know like uh, Timmy's obviously a blue card, but he does something that's very much a red mechanic, pinging for, for me, damage. Yeah, but for me, pinging has always been a blue. blue thing. Yeah, see, that's the difference in like as the formats it's progressed. Big. It's Timmy, you know, like I remember in Homelands where I saw that Man Minotaur, what was it actually? No, a goat? Yeah, this goat that can mm. deal damage, like a red goat. I'm like, what? Why is it dealing damage? That's not fair. <laughs> well, you, you know, know that's, that's, a, that's interesting because it, it ages us as players um, mm -hmm. with what you're mentioning now because I've always saw that as more of a red mechanic. So when did you actually get into the game? What year, if you remember the exact uh, year? Yeah, yeah, 1995. I got into the game and uh, like I started with, I got it here. Like I started with a starter deck like this, not this starter deck, but it just looked like this. So it's just revised. And I first thought I started in 1994, but then I was like, wait, I was, I was 10. I was too young. I think I started around 11. Uh, and then my brother told, because he was the reason I started, he needed somebody to, he needed somebody to play with. He told me, yeah, but in, in Hilversum, the city where I grew up, uh, there was this, like a little local store in our neighborhood. It was quite small and she sold fantasy stuff, including magic cards. So she still sold revised like until late 96. So I always thought that I started in, in 94 because of revised, you know? Uh, but yeah, she was just still selling it. And I never really liked fourth edition much. I was always a revised fan. Yeah. yeah well, revised looks the closest to ABU, obviously. And just not just the art, well, obviously, even the, the text and the formatting of the card, it's a little lighter and paler than unlimited cards, but at least you still have some of that nostalgia for the older sets. So these all revised? This is all revised. And this is, um, this is actually a deck that I play with my brother from time to time. So it's just unsleeved. And like we only play with cards that are already damaged. That's real old school. Yeah. Unsleeved yeah. cards? Like playing yeah. a deck unsleeved, there's nothing more like casual than that. That's a, wow. But look at the stain. You can of see it, the like. edges. Yeah, you can see the stains. <laughs> yeah, that card's seen some love for sure. Yeah, this tells a story, right? And that's that's mm. what I like when it when it tells a story. This and it's actually also, um, you know, we talked a little bit about the prices, I think, and I kind of see that as a problem. I don't see that as a positive thing. Uh, a problem in mm. terms of I like to play sleeveless, go to a bar, you know, shuffle this up play a game, leave it on the table, come back, you know. So you see the prices increasing a lot. It's, you see that as more of a negative than a positive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... Not if you want to cash out of your hobby one day, though. Uh, yeah, right? but I don't, I don't think I want to because it's just... No, I, well, not everyone does, of course. Like, even if you cash out, I don't necessarily mean you just liquidate your entire collection. Um, but you know, as things appreciate, there's always going to be cheaper ways to play like proxies, uh, like damaged cards. Um, but I, yeah, I, I, I do like the fact that the game is, has some worth. Like mm -hmm. I remember dual lands were, uh, $5 and then they went to $10 and then they went to $20. And I think like $20 for a card is kind of good enough for me. Hmm. Like then it gets value. You put it in a sleeve, you kind of treat it differently. You know, that's fine. But these prices are just, yeah. No, I agree. Like when the prices go up uh, too fast, too soon, there's definitely uh, not just a FOMO that's involved, but I, I think overall that's, that's not healthy for the game long-term for sure. I, I agree 100%. But I think a slight appreciation over time, I think is, is a net benefit um, 
for the game. I mean, there's two sides. I always looked at it as there's two sides. Uh, there's the Telerian Community College side, and then there's the oh. Alpha Investment side. When it comes to like Magic Gathering, because obviously they both love the game for maybe different reasons. Uh, they both play the game. Uh, well, I don't think Rudy plays as much anymore, but there's the side that wants them to be basically worthless pieces of cardboard, and there's the other side that wants them to appreciate over time. But I think there's like a healthy balance in the middle that I think no, most I, people I, would I, argue I is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's good that they have some value. But for example, a card like Eureka, I don't know if you know that card from, from Legends. Yeah. It's a fantastic card, right? I think it's is it two green and one or two green and two for sorcery. And basically what it does, if you have cards in your hand and you can just play out any card that you want. So you play out a card, then your opponent gets to play out a card, then you get to play out a card until you both stop, right? So even if your wow. opponent so what you can do is you can build just the coolest deck with the biggest creatures. But that's actually not a very good deck in old school. Oh, because right? someone just might have a better, you know, better yeah, it, uh, hand than you. For example, mm -hmm. but also, but also because big creatures are easy to get to get rid of, you know. But mm -hmm. my point more, my point more is that it's such a fun deck to play and it's a fun deck to have. And um, I love to brew decks, not necessarily because they win every game, but because they're just fun to play with. And, and that's kind of difficult when the prices go up as much as they do at the moment. That's, I, I do agree with that. That's, that's why I've been, I wanted to start covering uh, all the prices with the market mover videos that, that I've been releasing mm -hmm. on, a, on a pretty much daily basis. Um, there is positives and negatives to be seen with it for sure. I, I agree. Obviously some sort of balance in the middle um, would be the best outlook, I think for the future of the game and the health, health and longevity of it as well. Like I'm someone who I actually don't, when it comes to my, older collection i don't have as as much older cards as someone who plays old school or even legacy i i was a modern player when i actually got into magic the gathering that was around the return to ravnica era so oh, yeah. not yeah. super long ago well long almost a decade now i but, played a few release of that yeah it was it was great because right before that i was playing yeah. just tabletop magic with my friend we'd have beers it's funny that you're drinking a beer it was more of like we'd We'd go to a bar, have a few beers, and we'd come back uh, to his place. And we would, he was playing a lot of magic at that time, uh, semi competitively. And he had a bunch of just casual decks brewed, but they're always like mono colored. It was like a mono white deck, mono black deck, very yeah. simple to get, to get into the game. And I was drawn to mono red because I don't know if it's because I have ADHD or high anxiety, but I like, the, <laughs> I like the haste. Like when he said, Oh yeah, these creatures, there's no such, such thing as summoning sickness. I'm like, I'm in. Like, give me, give me haste. I want the haste. So like I wanted to swing it fast. Hmm? Yeah. Mono yeah, red, can. like all or nothing. I oh, love yeah. it. Do you know the card fork? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a card I love in old school. Like when you're actually like you know, of course I love to play blue, but when I play red, I love I love to play with fork, you know, because when you can fork an ancestral recall or time walk or you know, oh, even better imagine. when somebody disenchants one of your uh, whatever you've got on, on the board, you know, let's say a juggernaut, whatever. Mm -hmm. You play a fork and you copy the disenchant to take out their circle of protection red. Mm. Yeah. After sideboarding, right? That's priceless. Like they got See, those were cards that were printed in almost every every core set were the circle of protections. So I've actually talked about them recently in a market mover saying I think they're actually good specs, especially uh the seventh edition foils mm. of these copies, because that was the first time you can actually get them in foil. But uh, so I actually wanted to bring you on because because I actually am I'm debating on getting into an old school, or at least trying to make an old school deck. Now I know Sweet. Sweet. Yeah, we can play. That's a good idea. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking. So I don't uh, I don't have many old school cards, but I do have uh, some old school lands that I could use. Like old school revised lands, yeah, uh, and, some, and some unlimited there too. But that's okay. And I have a bunch of. This is where I keep all my older lands. I have a huge stack of them here. So if I had, let's say, if I wanted to do mono red, mm -hmm. or like mono black, or maybe a, a, I would say an in between. But I don't know if I want to be using uh, bad lands to be <laughs> in a deck like this. I don't know yeah, if I can afford to use to use a a play set of that in a deck. But if I was going to start out as a player, let's say I want to do mono. So mono black or mono red, what would you suggest? I think mono black is a really good 
place to start, but you would probably do red because you feel more of a connection there. But you know, mono mono black is you can play. Uh, you know, black knight two drop. You can play hypnotic specter. Uh, oh yeah, I've played with that. I've played with that card before. You can play dark ritual, which is kind oh of yeah, a, it's a tempo play. Oh yeah, and you probably don't have the mox or the or the black lotus, but then you no. can still yeah, you can still get into the tempo. Yeah, that's kind of nice. So and mono black yeah. then. Suchi, if you have the Suchi or Juggernaut, yeah, because I assume you don't have Jews and Jin. No, no, well, neither, no. neither do I, unfortunately. But yeah. it's a cool creature. So okay, so I'll have to actually research that deck later because I I feel like if you want to play old school, you got to use old school cards. That's why I brought out the old lands to show you because I feel like, like you it, can man. easily bring in any other basic lands are printed in every set. But if you're going to use a an old school build, you got to have the land base that just suits it from an aesthetic look. But also I think it's just, it makes more sense. Uh, if I'm playing old school with a group of guys at a table, I want all of our decks to at least look somewhat aesthetically pleasing to the eye, especially if you're going to stream it. So right. what I was suggesting is um, later at some point when I actually complete my janky deck, like casual janky deck, we can drop on maybe a live stream and have a game. Definitely. I would love to. I would love to. I could send you uh, a couple of videos with like budget decks, I guess, because uh, what I like to do, because I'm a big fan of revised because it's my alpha, right? So I like mm -hmm. to make a lot of revised decks. So for example, my mono black deck is a zombie deck with Nagnarol Disc and then Zombie Master and I can regenerate all my zombies. And I use Evil Presence to create swamps um, at my opponent's side of the table, right? So I can kill them with Swamp Walk. Um, Oh yeah. But you can also, of course, play play mono red as well. Um, do you have bull lightnings? I, I love bull lightnings. I do. I do. Yeah. I don't think I have a playset of them in revise though. I well, know I in have the dark, in the dark, and I believe in fourth edition, right? So you can. I, I was thinking. Right. Okay, so if I was going to make like a mono red or mono black deck, what sets could I draw cards from? Yeah, so you'd, I, I would I would not make it too difficult for yourself. I would just definitely go up to fourth edition. I would add Chronicles as well, because remember they have the same art. I think what makes old school um, so special is it's so recognizable. You've got a smaller card pool, and that's also I think why people enjoy um, watching the matches on my channel, because I don't have to tell them this is this and this card. This this is what it does. You know, people recognize the art. They they know immediately. So you've got Alpha Beta Unlimited Revised uh, fourth edition. You've got the four horsemen sets. You've got Chronicle to choose from. So it's, it's quite a lot. So, like, yeah, so it's, that's obviously a good cheap alternative. Chronicles pretty much reprinted the majority or a pretty big chunk of the four horsemen sets in there. Yeah. Exactly. So they have the four horsemen symbols. So if I wanted to use something from Arabian Nights, for example, um, I don't know if I want to be digging into my collection and, you know, well, using it, my Arabian Nights cards. So I would use Chronicles. Like, yeah, a card that I like is Earth Raiders. Uh, one black and one for two, three. That's pretty solid. You can play with that. Then you get a bad moon on the battlefield. You've got a three, four. You know, those are pretty good stats in old school. Yeah, four, that's four, a, it, yeah. Any sort of lord is powerful in old school. Just giving your creatures plus one, plus one, all of them. That's that's enough an effect to win a game. I feel like in old school. I mean, even, it's still powerful in in any form. Drain, but... drain life, drain life, and a dark ritual. You know, in a mono black deck. Yeah, yeah. Well, Dark Ritual. I remember the first time I discovered that card. I I was like, this 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 can't be like this has to be banned. Because <laughs> uh, a friend of mine, um, he used to play Magic around the same time you you got started. He's a few years older than me, not much older. Um, but he had a little box of cards he, he gave me. This is about 2013 when I was getting into Magic with Return to Ravnica, Gate Crash, and, and Dragon's Maze. And we were hanging out a lot. Uh, he wasn't playing magic, but uh, he knew I always I was always going out to play with uh you know friends or at game stores. So he he told me, hey, I have this uh, box of cards I used to play as a kid, and I was like, you used to play magic? He's like, yeah, like I'll I'm gonna head up to my my folks' place and I'll bring him down next time we hang out if you come over for beers or, or we're gonna watch a game. And the next time I was over, he he brought out this box and he must have been playing. Uh, it was either it might have been a starter deck, but it was. Mostly mono black from, from what I remember. That might have been a Timmy deck. I remember seeing Prodigal Sorcerers. And uh, there was Dark Rituals, Royal Assassins, yeah, Black Knight. Royal. Black yeah. Knight, yeah. 
So I think that was an old school deck. And there was a howling mine. I remember that. There was a howling mine. Again, it really depends also on the strategy. If you want to go more like for a mid-game strategy, like control strategy, um, Royal Assassin is a better choice. If you want to go more for an aggro strategy, it's usually Hypnotic Spectre, smaller creatures. Yeah, I remember seeing that. Yeah. So it's just funny, like uh, you just reminded me of that. I, I, I was going to speak about that, but then when you brought up the Dark Rituals, yeah, just like it's basically a one mana, uh, I guess a one mana Black Lotus. In a way, like, well, except it's all black. Obviously, you the, can't problem is, the problem is, the problem is, you can set yourself up for a two for one because if you go turn one dark ritual hippie, right, which is a very well known play, yeah, and your opponent goes turn one uh, a plain source of blousers, yeah, that's it. or or, that's or lightning bolt, or you know, so it is, it is, risky, but you gain, but at least you get to gain that life, right? <laughs> uh, do you? No, we, sword, oh, we're, we're sword sword yeah. Yeah. you gain two life, you gain two life. Okay, yeah. Yeah, but that's not okay. really much, I guess. I, it's not a very good trade off, I don't think. But and you lose two cards, and your opponent only one. So that's the biggest. That's the biggest problem. Yeah. No, that's true. That is a good point. Well, so uh, anyways, so how can people find you on YouTube? Is it? Um, yeah, the show is called Timmy Talks, but it's Timmy the Sorcerer. So it's youtube.com slash, we'll probably put it in the description, I guess. Yeah, I'll put so it in the description for Timmy people to find. Channel right slash uh, Timmy the Sorcerer, and they can uh, they can find me. And you, okay. can, you can find matches and tournaments and everything, like, yeah. Yeah, and uh, it's really, for someone who's like a beginner, if you're a beginner watching this, and you're trying to get into old school magic, I think his channel is a great starting off point. So I've learned a lot. And it's kind of got me inspired now to want to make my own old school deck and try to maybe jump into the format. And then maybe I can come back on here one day with you later on and we can uh, have a game. Yeah, but well then I got to put the game on my channel as well, of course. Yeah. Well, exactly. I have multiple yeah. games, whatever. And I mean, red is also a good option. I'm more, more when I talk about red, I got to think about a Goblin King because I think it's such a cool card. Yeah. Yeah. And no, you can do mono red. Uh, I guess goblins is that a thing in old school as well? Yeah, it is. It is. It's not top tier. Not for, yeah, yeah. You can play definitely, and you can have lightning bolt, super strong. But you also have earthquake, which is kind of good. Not as good when you play with goblins yourself, but mm. it is a very powerful card. You've got fireball. You've got disintegrates. You've got the burn package. You got mana vaults, which I think are really good when you're playing with a lot of X spells. So yeah, you've got some possibilities. Shivan dragon. Yeah, fire breathing. Lista Benson. Mm -hmm. You know, beautiful art. Like the new art of Sheevan. Oh. Yeah, it's not quite the yeah. same. Not quite the same. All right. Well, anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you want to find uh, Thomas, he has his YouTube channel. I'll list it down below. Timmy Talks as well. And you can find all of old school gaming. And it's a great jumping off point for any player looking to get into that format. So, uh, yeah, Thomas, it was great. Great talking to you. Hopefully yeah, we can do this again me. real soon. Cheers, man. All right. Take care. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you do, remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. And if you enjoyed it that much, maybe you'd like to tip me. I have a PayPal link that you can send me tips if you enjoy these videos, and I can keep bringing them to you that way, and it could help my cardboard crack addiction. So please, think about uh, supporting the channel in that way. If not, subscribe, like, leave a comment, and I will see you again in the next video.